Please turn to Psalm 32, and we're going to start there. Our main text this morning is going to be the whole book of Philemon, um, but I came across this psalm this past week in preparation for this teaching, and we're only going to read these first two verses in Psalm chapter 32. Um, And I think it's fitting for the topic that we'll be covering in Philemon. Okay, Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2, and I'll be reading from the NASB this morning, so it might sound a little bit different, uh, but that's all right. It's still God's word. Verse 1, it says, How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. One more time. Verse 1. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. Praise God. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Is there anyone here that can identify with these two verses? Okay. I thank the Lord daily for his forgiveness eternally for my sins. The fact that Christ would come down and die for me in my place blows my mind. So that I don't have to go through that wrath of God myself. To understand that the full wrath of God Almighty was poured out in a single event on the person Jesus Christ, to deal with every sin, past, present, and future, so that we can have hope of eternal life, blows my mind. And I think it's a good reminder for us, periodically, just to brush up on the fact that we are forgiven people if we are found in Christ. If you're here this morning and you have no idea what that means, um, we've been praying for you, you know. And whoever invited you this morning has been praying for you. That you would experience the love of Christ for the first time. That you would experience the forgiveness and patience and grace and mercy that God has to offer you. And so this morning, if that's you, I ask that you would just be open to listening to what God has to say to you this morning. Okay. With that, please turn to the book of Philemon. Okay, Philemon is in the New Testament. It's a very long book comprised of only 25 verses. It's not even a chapter, chapter 1, chapter 2. It's just Philemon, verses 1 through 25. If you're having trouble finding it, use your table of contents. That's totally okay. Um, But just a hint, it's right before the book of Hebrews, okay, in in the New Testament. Okay. And let me get there myself. We used to have um, a college ministry here, a young adult ministry here at church, and it's been two years since we did this Philemon study um, at that group. As I was praying about, Lord, you know, what do you want to share with your people um, on Sunday, this study came to mind. Now, we broke up that study, I think, two to three weeks, because there's just a lot in here to go over. Yeah, it's only one or 25 verses, but there's such a depth located in this book. Um, we're going to try to do our best to uncover those. Um, but our goal this morning is to become familiar with the major themes of this book, as well as gain an understanding of how this book fits in the overall plan of God's redemption. Okay. Originally, the book of Philemon was a personal letter written from the Apostle Paul to Philemon. This dude called Philemon. And if you want to pronounce it correctly, like according to how you're supposed to cor- pronounce it in the Greek, it's Philemon. It, I just don't like it. It sounds weird to me. It, I think of McDonald's and Pokemon combined. You know what I mean? So for um, my sanity, we're just going to pronounce it Philemon, okay, not Philemon. Uh, but he was a resident of the city called Colossae, okay, and Colossae was the city to which the letter to the Colossians was written to. It shares with us the story of Onesimus. Everyone say Onesimus. Okay, and there's one more coming up. Onesimus was a a runaway slave turned redeemed saint. And the application of love as a result of the gospel. So we're going to learn these things about Onesimus and this other guy called Philemon. Okay, everyone say Philemon. 
All right, great. You're going to mispronounce it with me from now on. That's okay. This book is about hope for the runaway, for those who have turned away from God, and it is an encouragement to those who are struggling to love them in the meantime. More importantly, the book of Philemon is about the rescuing and redeeming power and love of the Lord Jesus Christ. To transform an individual from useless to useful, from slave to free, and from death to life. We learn that the gospel of Jesus Christ rescues, redeems, and repurposes people for God's glory and God's pleasure. Okay, it's an awesome little book. Join me as I read the entire book of Philemon, all 25 verses. Okay, verse 1 says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Apphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always, making mention of you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. For I've come to have much joy and comfort in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you, since I am such a person as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Verse 10, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. I have sent him back to you in person, that is, sending my very heart, whom I wish to keep with me, so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. But without consent, I did not want to do anything so that your goodness would not be, in effect, by compulsion, but of your own free will. For perhaps he was for this reason separated from you for a while, that you would have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If then you regard me as a partner, accept him as you would me. But if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it, not to mention to you that you owe, me, owe to me even your own self as well. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Verse 21, having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, since I know that you will do even more than what I say. At the same time also, prepare a lodging for me, for I hope that through your prayers I will be given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers. Verse 25, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are and for what you've done for us. We understand that we are so undeserving of that salvation and that it's strictly by grace that we are saved. Thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to minister to us and we ask right now that he would teach us, Lord, that he would be our teacher this morning that he would show us the deep things that are contained in this little letter. And that as a result of our study this morning, we would leave here with a better understanding and a stronger adoration for you and your word. Lord, forgive us for falling short time and time again. We thank you again for your grace that makes up for it. 
Lord, but I pray right now that you would just speak loud and clear to each of us this morning. If there are any distractions that are bogging us down, I pray that you would get rid of them in the name of Jesus, that we may focus and have all our attention again on you and your word. We ask that Christ would be glorified this morning. Speak through me, order my words. May I speak clearly, Lord, your truth. Again, all with the goal of bringing you glory. We love you so much. We thank you immensely. And we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Well, in verses 1 through 3, we have the author and the recipient of the letter. Let's read 1 through 3 again. It says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Apphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul introduces himself as the author of this letter. And he introduces himself and describes himself in a very unique way here. Typically, how does he introduce himself when writing epistles? He says, I, Paul, A, or N. He starts with an A, ends with apostle. An apostle of Jesus Christ, right? Normally, he's, he, he, he comes in with that intro. And oftentimes, it's fitting because in those letters, he's writing to correct problems in different cities, in different churches. This letter is different in that it's written to a single person, okay, Philemon. He attaches Apphia and Archippus as well, and, and, you know, kind of the church in their house, but it's directed to Philemon. And so instead of coming in saying, I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, you know, imposing kind of his, his uh, rank and superiority, he comes in a little bit differently. And he says, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Interestingly enough, at this time when he's writing this letter, he's actually a prisoner in Rome for the sake of the gospel. So I think that has some sort of an influence as to why he would say, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. But more than that, I think he's wanting to identify himself with the other character written in this book, okay, Onesimus. Okay. He wants to identify himself with Onesimus with the goal of having Philemon showing kind of an understanding, kind of the sympathy um, that he needs to be showing to Onesimus. Okay. If Paul, the great apostle Paul, is a prisoner, um, and Onesimus is, you know, kind of, he's a slave, again, I think that Paul's trying to get this, this idea I'm across to Philemon. So he says, again, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and, he's, and he mentions Timothy, his son in the faith. He's also there with him. Um, Apphia, many believe, is Philemon's wife, okay? And that Archippus is their son, and possibly the pastor there um, in their house church. Now, we don't know if this is the church of Colossae, but we know this is at least a church or one of the churches there. Um, and it's kind of cool that they did this meeting, you know, in, in their house and hanging out, probably doing um, koinonia potluck every week or whatever they do, but just sharing things, having all things in common. Okay. So they're there, and he's writing to them, and, and he's going to bring up this other character who all three of those people, in fact, the, probably the rest of the church, um, is familiar with Onesimus. Okay. Verse 3, he imparts his usual greeting, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Notice what he calls Philemon in verse 1. And they're very endearing terms. Okay. This, this letter is very intimate. It's very personable. He says he is our beloved brother and he's a fellow worker. Hinting to the fact that Philemon is probably in ministry. He's probably serving in some capacity. And at the very least... He's hospitable, you know, to the church that meets in their house. Um, Archippus, again, he says that fellow soldier, that's where people believe that he's kind of a co-laborer for the gospel. Again, possibly the pastor there in that church. And then again, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Now in verses 4 through 7, 
we get a peek into the character of Philemon, okay? who he is as a man. And I think it's one that should be emulated. Okay? He's a very good guy. Let's read verses 4 through 7. Paul writes, I thank my God always, making mention of you in my prayers. To even be mentioned in Paul's prayers is, is a big deal, I think. Verse 5, because I hear of your love and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. For I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. What we see here is that Philemon's faith was not a secret. Okay? He didn't hide behind walls. He didn't just stay within the confines of his house church. But he was active with his faith. Okay. Again, Paul has heard of his love and of his faith, which he had toward Jesus, obviously, but also toward the saints. It's one thing to say things, right? And a completely other thing to do things, right? This guy, Philemon, didn't rely on his words or his confession of Jesus, but he walked these things out in everyday life. And verse 7, it's a unique ministry that Paul describes of Philemon. He says, For I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Now, I didn't do a word study on this term refreshed, but I don't remember any other time in the New Testament where someone is mentioned of refreshing God's people. Okay? It's, I think, a unique thing to Philemon's ministry. And if you're familiar with the conference center here, Pastor Rod is the director on campus. Our goal here on campus is to refresh God's people, that whoever would come through these gates and onto our campus, that they would leave here having been refreshed, having, been, having um, had a chance to meet with the Lord. And again, it's taken from Philemon, verse 7. But Paul loves Philemon because Philemon has a love, not only for Jesus, but also for his people. Okay. Philemon loved the church, and he demonstrated it in visible ways. I want to ask us a question of application, um, just for everyone here. And it's this, what is your view of the church? What is your mindset concerning the church? Is it one of cynicism? Doubt? Are you hesitant because in your head you're thinking, oh, it's just a matter of time before so-and-so messes up? Are you kind of reserved a little bit because you're just not sure? Okay. I want to encourage you that if you are a Christian, if you have put your faith in Christ, and are indeed found in him, that those thoughts, those attitudes, those mindsets have no place within the church. Okay. We can't be people who are second-guessing the person next to us. If they claim to be a Christian, we need to treat them as such. Okay. And this is the lesson that Philemon is going to learn firsthand concerning Onesimus, that no matter what Onesimus did before coming to Christ, now that he is a Christian, he's under the same label as one of God's beloved. Okay? Someone in whom God delights in. Not based on who Onesimus is or what he's done, but simply because of who Christ is and what Christ has done. And same thing goes for us, guys. If we are Christians here today, and I trust most of us are. I see most of us here every week. Um, we cannot have that attitude of cynicism, of doubt, of reservedness, kind of. Okay? Let's be open with each other. Let's be humble enough to share our weaknesses, to let others in on our lives, our struggles, the things that are, are worrying us day to day, with the hope that they in turn give us encouragement, Pray for us, 
give us scripture, and ultimately point us to the Lord. Now, if someone does come to us with an issue, um, let's not be judging, right? Don't be judging. Come alongside, have some compassion, empathize, show some sympathy for your brother or your sister. Okay? Again, Philemon was a man who loved the church, and we would do well to do, to, to do likewise. And again, it was visible through his actions. He refreshed God's people. Verses 8 through 9 now. He says, Therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you. Since I am such a person as Paul the aged, I'm an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Verses 8 and 9, um, in these verses, Paul starts to round a corner okay, in this letter. Paul says, Philemon, I, I could very well order you to do this right now, but I'd rather appeal to you for love's sake, okay? Because I know that you know the right thing to do. And plus, I'm kind of old, you know what I mean? I'm also a prisoner right now, so at the very least, do it, you know, for those kind of things as well. But again, Paul could very easily have ordered him. He could have asserted his, his rank, I'm an apostle, I'm a preacher, I'm the great evangelist through whom probably the church got, got planted in Colossae as a result of Paul's ministry in Ephesus. People believe that Epaphras, the guy listed at the very end of the letter, was in Ephesus when Paul was there, got converted in Ephesus, and then went back home to Colossae and, and planted this church. So Philemon knows who, who Paul is, and Paul knows that he knows who he is. But instead of lording it over him, he comes alongside he submits himself, and he says, Rather, I'd, I, I want to appeal to you. Okay, I want to appeal to you. Paul understood that um, lording it over God's people is not the way God wants his people to be shepherded. That it's not this way among you, he'll say. Um, and then that fear and compulsion are bad motivators in ministry. And God wanted Paul to lovingly show Philemon what to do so that Philemon would actually want to do this himself. Paul saw this as an opportunity for Philemon to listen to the Holy Spirit's prompting to do the right thing. And we often, personally, come across these opportunities as well, okay? Where we could very easily, because of our position at work or whatever, you know, order someone to do something. My personality type is, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the 16 personality type test thingies online. Um, it's a million questions, takes like five hours, don't do it. Um, but I did it, 20 minutes, not that bad. And I got, uh, my title was, um, shoot, babe, what's it called? The Executive. <laughs> and it says that my personality type is made for being in leadership over people. And that I have, a, my personality type, has a way to kind of like make people do the things I want them to do. Now that could be a good thing um, in the world or a bad thing in the church. And unfortunately, those business uh, principles creep their way into the church to where pastors become CEOs, right? And that's not good, okay? Pastors are not CEOs. They're sheep just like everyone else. There's only one shepherd. And who's that? Jesus Christ. He is the chief shepherd. And so, as a pastor here at the church, this is something that I have to battle against. Again, my personality type, not that I put a lot of stock into it, but I catch myself doing this. I could very easily text someone and say, Christian, get the chairs. And he would do it, probably. Hey, Ben, get the water, Cambros. It's hot outside. And he would probably do it, okay? And sometimes I do. But, uh, Honest, honest confessions right now. Um, but I rather would take the other side and, and ask them, you know, instead of telling them, ask them to do these things. I know they know the right thing to do, and they would totally do it, but it's totally different to tell um, versus to ask. Do you guys agree? You know, it's just easier, to, it's nicer, you know, to be asked to do something. And so Paul here is exemplifying, you know, this ministry principle that, again, fear and compulsion are bad motivators when it comes to ministry. 
And that love from a pure heart is why we should do things, our love for Christ and our love for his people. Okay? And again, you guys don't really, might not know our leadership team as well, but the pastoral staff, the deacons and elders guys, I'm blessed by them. Um, we're not perfect, but we try our best, you know, um, by the grace of God to shepherd the flock, you know, as under shepherds underneath Christ, the best we know how to do, okay? Under the power of the Holy Spirit, and again, by his grace and for his glory, um, it's, we, have, we have a good team. You guys, you guys are in really good hands um, here at church. And does everything happen according to plan or how we desire or how we thought things would? Like almost never. Um, but we're flexible enough, you know? And as Ben mentioned um, earlier, we're going to be back in the auditorium again finally after being two weeks over here. And so for those of us who set up, we're not going to have to lug all the tables and chairs over here and yada, 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 and then put them back in the hot sun. We're sweating. We can kind of just do it over there nicely. Um, but thank you guys for being flexible. And, and just know that we love you guys as, as a pastoral and, and ministry leadership team. Uh, we really desire what's best for you guys and, and to, see, to, sh- to kind of shepherd you guys and to shepherd each other uh, to where God wants us to go. And so if that is any comfort, I don't know, maybe... But just know that we love you guys, okay? Thanks. All right. Now, verse 10 through 16, okay? Now, this is kind of the meat of this book, verses 10 through 16. And this is where Paul reveals to Philemon the whole point of this letter, okay? And like I said before, it's so that Philemon would receive Onesimus back, okay? Okay? Receive Onesimus back. Let's read verses 10 through 16. He says, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful, both to you and to me. I have sent him back to you in person, that is sending my very heart, whom I wish to keep with me, so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. But without your consent, I did not want to do anything, so that your goodness would not be, in effect, by compulsion, but of your own free will. For perhaps he was, for this reason, separated from you for a while, that you would have him back forever. Verse 16, No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Now, somehow, some way, Onesimus escapes Colossae, the house of the Philemon, and finds himself all the way in Rome. If you're unfamiliar with geography, that area, turn to the back of your Bible and just look at the maps. Look at where Colossae is at compared to Rome. Okay. Rome, obviously, is in what country? Italy. The boot, right? Italy. And Colossae is actually in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. It's very close to, to Ephesus. So somehow, some way, Onesimus escapes from Colossae and finds himself all the way in Rome. And I think this is divine providence because he somehow ends up in a Bible study where he meets Paul, okay? Paul preaches the gospel message. Onesimus receives it, and he gets converted. He gets saved. Again, I think this is an act of God because how else is that going to happen? Me, it's like me going to L.A. and then meeting your best friend from elementary school. Like, what are the chances of that, okay? Very, very hard, and, and that's what, kind of what Paul gets at in verse 10, talking about how he converted. He's now a Christian. He says, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, that he came to me messed up and wrecked. And as a result of the gospel, he got saved, and he's now a Christian. Okay? He's my child in the faith. Verse 11, who, was former, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. Verse 11 is an example of what the gospel can do 
in people's lives. It changes people from one thing to the complete opposite. Onimis, Onesimus had run away, and it's believed that he even stole money okay, from Philemon, because in verse 18, Paul mentions that if he owes anything, to charge himself, charge Paul. So he's a runaway slave, but he's also a thief. No doubt he had no plans to return back to Colossae, let alone pay anything back. Okay. Also, Onesimus' life was in danger because the penalty, the common penalty of the day for slaves, for lesser offenses than running away in theft, was crucifixion. Okay. So this guy is at the end of the end right now. He's on the run from the authorities, nowhere to go. He's running out of that stolen money. He doesn't have a job. He's down and out right now. But this is exactly when Christ steps in. And often, with people today, maybe, maybe you, you know, experience this, you were at the end of your line, the end of your rope. Nothing but darkness around you, and then the light of the gospel shone in. Okay. This is often how God meets people. For Paul, he was on his way to persecute more Christians in Acts chapter 9. On his way to persecute more Christians, a bright light shines from heaven, he falls down to the ground and has this crazy encounter with the risen King Jesus. He immediately recognizes that whoever is speaking is superior to him. He says, who are you, Lord? And Jesus answers him, it's me, Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And so Paul, on the way to persecute, Onesimus, on his way to, you know, on his runaway, getaway right now, Christ steps in and the gospel intercepts him. And you might know people, again, who have a similar story. Um, being here at the Bible College and, and Conference Center, we get to meet a lot of students and um, just retreat guests on the weekends. And initially, when you hear about a Bible College student, you kind of just think, oh, these people are so awesome. They're perfect. They're training to be in ministry. They're going to be future church planters and leaders. And they've probably been walking with the Lord for, I don't know, 30,000 years. They probably pray eight times a day, 30 hours per, you know, per session. And sorry to burst your bubble if that's your view of Bible college students, but often the opposite is very true, right? They get saved yesterday, and it just so happens that the semester starts today. And now they're here, you know. So they have these radical, crazy encounters with the Lord. They get saved and stuff. Um, either way, whether it's an Onesimus story or a Bible college student story, praise God that they get saved, right? Praise the Lord. So this message of salvation by grace alone, through faith in Christ alone, resonated in the heart of Onesimus. Again, so much so that he gave his life to Christ. He understood that he was lost, and hopeless in his sin, and that he needed a savior. He wasn't in good shape, but by God's grace, the gospel rescued and redeemed him. Now, you might know someone like this, who are still in that runaway phase. They know the Lord, maybe. They're fighting against the goads. They're doing the complete opposite of what they know they should be doing. I want to let you know whether it's a family member, a friend, coworker, or classmate, that hope is not lost for that person. Okay? I know many of you have stories, right? You've opened up with us. And we know that you guys are still praying for those people. And my encouragement is to keep praying. Okay? Keep praying. Entrust God to do his work. Okay? It's not up to you to save them. Understand that. Don't put that pressure on yourself. It's not up to you to save people. Okay? That responsibility, that job, remains always with the Lord. Entrust them into his capable hands and watch him again do work. Come to the realization that God infinitely cares about that person way more than you ever will. 
that he loves them way more than you are capable of and that he can reach them, even if they're trying their best to blend in with the crowd in Rome, so to speak, figuratively speaking, okay? God's got them. Now, maybe you are or have been that person, that Onesimus, running away from God. Maybe you know exactly the right thing to do. And I want to let you know that you're not here by accident this morning and that God wants you to know this, that he loves you infinitely more than you can imagine. He loves you. He loves your family. He loves whatever's going on in your life. You know, he's letting that happen for a reason. He has not turned his back on you. It may seem like that. You may seem like you're being persecuted all day long like David and just cry and mourn and not know what is going on. It's darkness. All you can see is cloud and fog. Trust that God knows what he's doing. Okay? Trust. Faith is humble trust and obedience in and to the word of God. Trust and have faith in God. I don't care if you think you're unlovable. I don't care if you think your situation is lost. Okay? If you're still breathing, there's still a chance. Okay? If you're still breathing right now, there's still a chance for God to step in and intervene. I shared this last time I taught, but it's as easy for Jesus, for God, to say, peace, be still, and whatever winds or waves are going on around you, th- they can stop at, at, at a word of Christ. Okay? It's just as easy for him to say that now as it was back then with the disciples on that boat. Peace, be still. So take courage, take heart, that God's got you. That the resounding message of the Bible declares that God loves you. Okay. Again, so much so that he sent his son, and we've covered that already, the gospel message. God is faithful because he cannot deny himself. Praise the Lord. Verse 11, again. Who formerly was useless to you, but now is youth- useful to both to you and to me. What's going on in this verse is Paul is using a play on words. Okay? The word or the name Onesimus actually means useful. Okay? So he's saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put these kind of words in Paul's mouth a little bit. At one time he was a ah, Onesimus. I don't know if that's the right word. He was useless, but now he is useful. That now that Onesimus has put his faith and trust in Christ, and now that he is operating under the conviction and power of the Holy Spirit, that now, finally, Onesimus is operating in the full meaning of his name, useful. Where he, will, where he was once useless, again, a runaway slave, he is now useful. And again, this is what the gospel does, right? This is what the gospel does. It changes people completely. Verse 12. Through 14. I have sent him back to you in person that is sending my very heart, whom I wish to keep with me, so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. But without your consent, I did not want to do anything, so that your goodness would not be, in effect, by compulsion, but of your own free will. Again, Paul is here giving Philemon a chance to respond positively to the Holy Spirit's prompting and to do the right thing. Again, not by compulsion or force, but because being gracious and forgiving and loving are the the direct result of the Holy Spirit's work in the believer. And what Paul's saying here is, if in fact, Philemon, you are what you say you are, or you are what I've heard you to be, you will do as I request. That he will give Onesimus another chance. And I find it, again, really interesting that look at the change in Onesimus, okay? Again, where once he was running away and possibly a thief, he now is wanted in ministry by the great Apostle Paul, okay? That's a crazy transformation. Again, only the gospel can do that. But that's how different he was now. He no longer was a runaway slave, but a redeemed saint serving alongside Paul, okay? 
Crazy, crazy, crazy transformation. And yet we see Paul say, you know, I want to keep him here so he can minister with me. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent. Okay, so I'm sending him back to you. Do the right thing, Philemon. Verse 15 and 16 says, For perhaps he was, for this reason, separated from you for a while, that you would have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Verses 15 and 16 give perspective on the predicament, if you're taking notes. Perspective on the predicament. That maybe this is the reason why he escaped, so that he could find Christ. Okay? And sometimes people need something drastic to happen in their life in order to come to their wit's end that they might find Christ. And this was the case, apparently, for Onesimus. Now, it takes a lot to have this perspective when life happens in similar ways. When we are confronted with the unknowns of life, it takes perspective, and I think a godly one at that, to see things as Paul here is seeing them. Now, how do we develop that kind of perspective? How do we develop a perspective that trusts God no matter what, knowing that God is the, the wisest, he is the wise God, and as Rod, Pastor Rod has, has shared with us continually, that he knows the best way for us to get from point A to point B, and that whatever is happening is a direct result of that plan that God has for that individual. And I think the answer on how to develop that kind of perspective is just spending time in the Word. Because countless times, God does something with the impossible. Okay? God answers those unknowns. Many times, not according to how people thought he was going to answer. Okay? When it was time for the Israelites to finally conquer and enter into the Promised Land, what was the first... Jer- okay, Jericho was the first place that they encountered. And instead of some sort of battle plan, what did God tell them to do? Walk around the city. Just walk. And on the last day, you're going to walk again, you're going sh- to shout, you're going to blow trumpets, and you aren't even going to have to do anything. The walls will come tumbling down. Not one Israelite, Joshua and Caleb included, I bet you, had that as as a battle plan, you know. Um, when before that, at the Red Sea, when they're backed up with nowhere to go, Moses is kind of just like, okay, Lord, you better do something. You know, he trusted God. He knew that God was going to get him out of Egypt. But who could have fathomed the parting of the Red Sea? Okay. Nobody. Has it happened since or before, right? But that's how God works. Okay? And so Onesimus here is the perfect example of God doing the craziest thing with what looks like an impossible situation. And if you are facing an unknown right now, and if you're not, you aren't alive, okay? If you're facing an unknown, trust God, okay? And those two words are so easy for me to say. I have said it over and over again. Trust God, trust God, trust God. But that's the answer. There's, there's no other formula. There's no other equation but simple trusting in God. Okay? Trust the Lord to provide. Trust the Lord to protect. Trust the Lord to come through because he will. Okay? Because he will. All right? So perhaps he was for this reason separated from you for a while that you would have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, Philemon, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Unknowns are only unknown to us, right? When it comes to God, there's no unknowns. God knows no unknown. He's omniscient. He's all wise. Just like you, I think Philemon kind of struggled understanding this, uh, but Paul doesn't put it up for debate. He simply states it. 
that although he was gone for a time, he will be back forever. Okay? Not simply in your household, serving you and whatnot, but as a, as a brother now in the Lord, one day in heaven, eternally. Okay. In verses 17 through 20 now, we're almost done. We get, we're going to see Paul act as a type of Christ. Okay, a type of Christ. Not Jesus himself, but something very, very similar to it. Read with me verses 17 through 20. He says, If then you regard me as a partner, accept me, accept him as you would me. But if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it, not to mention to you that you owe, that you owe to me even your very own self as well. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. So how does Paul act like a type of Christ here? How does he act like a type of Christ? And it's this, that although he didn't owe this debt personal, personally, he was willing to pay it in full on behalf of Onesimus. You guys get that? And that's exactly what Jesus did, right? He didn't owe anything. He never sinned. He was the perfect man and the only perfect man ever to live on this earth. But he was willing to pay our debts with his own life so that we would have the imputed righteousness of Christ. And Romans 8.34 says that Christ stands at the right hand of the throne of God, interceding on our behalf. He's pointing to the fact that he paid our debt, and again, that we are now righteous in Christ. He is constantly doing this for you and for me before the Father. Okay? Because without that sacrifice, without that atonement, if we were to come into God's presence, full of our sin nature, what would happen? I don't know what would happen, but nothing good, right? Sin cannot dwell in his presence. He's perfectly holy. Okay? And without that righteousness, without being washed with the blood of Christ and covered in Christ... We're done. But the truth remains that if you are a Christian, you are found in Christ. And again, as Rod shared before he went to Europe, if you're found in Christ, you are now accepted in the Beloved. You have no more need to fear coming before a holy God. In fact, Hebrews says you can now approach the throne of God with boldness, okay, with confidence. And that when you pray, it's not an inconvenience to God. That you have access to his ear whenever you need it. And that, in fact, the Bible says he inclines his ear to hear your prayers. Okay? You have a relationship with the Lord now, not, again, based on who you are or anything you've ever done, but solely and only upon the work and person of Christ. I really admire Paul's heart here, okay, on behalf of Onesimus. Um, you can almost feel the affection that Paul has for Onesimus, being willing to identify himself with this, in Philemon's mind, with this convict, right? This escaped convict, in effect. But I think he's doing a really good job of conveying his care, his love, and the changed nature of Philemon, or of Onesimus to Philemon. At the end of verse 20, Paul appeals to Philemon's ministry of refreshing the saints and says, to do this would to be what to refresh his heart in Christ. He's kind of pulling at Philemon's heartstrings here, right? He's saying, I know this is your this is your ministry that's kind of unique to you in all of Scripture, Philemon verse 7, that you refresh God's people. Now, please, Philemon, receive Onesimus, and as a result of that, refresh my heart in the Lord. Okay. 21. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you since I know that you will do even more than what I say. So Paul is confident that Philemon will go through with his request and even more so. And get this, guys. Um, Onesimus was part of the team to disperse these letters as missionary, missionary messengers in 
you know, the modern, the, the first century church. Onesimus is part of the team to deliver these epistles to these churches. And when it comes time to deliver maybe the, the, the letter to the Colossians, as well as this letter to Philemon, um, chances are he's there when this is read out loud at the church that meets in Philemon's house. Okay? Kind of awkward, a little bit. Um, Paul doesn't think so. He wrote it, you know, very boldly. But Onesimus is standing there hearing Paul say this about him to his master. Okay? And I think for, the, for Onesimus, it would have been very encouraging to understand that Paul was in his corner. Um, he could have maybe cheated ahead of time and, and read it before getting there. I'm going to pull at his integrity and say he didn't do that. So who knows what Paul's going to say in this letter to Philemon. But what comes out is the heart of a pastor, someone who loves, again, this child in the faith, as Paul has called him. And for me, being in ministry sometimes can be a hard thing, right? Um, you, you do things for people, um, be, you know, not to get anything in return, but just because it's the right thing to do, right? You love this person, they've been coming to church for a while, and then you hear of some crazy event that happens, and that person that you were involved with, that you helped out, like, totally did something counter to what maybe in your head you, they thought should have been done, Right? And now they're the Onesimus, okay? Now I get a chance to be the Philemon and, and show that grace if they return, um, you know, back to the fold. But this is something that um, doesn't come natural for me. If someone wrongs me for whatever reason, I'm very quick to write them off. And something that the Lord's been doing in my heart, you know, not just as a result of this study, but just in general, is, is how to be more gracious and patient with people. Um, again, with that personality type, that CEO, the executive, it would be easier just to, you know, fire them from the church. Uh, you, you know, they're just a volunteer. You can't really fire a volunteer, but um, it'd be, that's kind of like my first instinct. Like, bro, you said you'd be here at 930, and it's like next week already, and I still haven't seen you, like around camp. It's like, where, I mean, where, where have you gone? Um, it's very easy for me to write them off, but that's not God's heart you know, for his people. And first and foremost, they're his people. They're not mine, right? And so, um, so that's something, you know, that, that I've been learning about in ministry, how to be gracious, how to be patient. Uh, verse 22, at the same time, also prepare me a lodging, for I hope that through your prayers, I will be given to you. Verse 23, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you. Again, Epaphras is probably the guy who planted the church in Colossae, so uh, Philemon and him are possibly friends. They know each other. Verse 24, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and if you keep reading, Demas doesn't have a really good ending, but he's still there right now, faithful, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Um. Before we end, something that I think Philemon is, is learning through this whole process is how to love people um, based on who they are now in Christ. Okay, as I shared, it would be very easy you know, for Philemon to write off Onesimus, but that's not what he's to do. Okay, we, we covered this whole thing. I mean, you can probably already tell, but Philemon's name comes from the root word Phileo. Okay, and what does that root word mean in the Greek? Philadelphia is the city of what? Brotherly love. And so this guy Philemon's name is built on the term Phileo, again, which means brotherly love. And so now Philemon has a chance to live up to his namesake. And, and I think Paul is kind of using all these play on words to make his point here. Um, but Philemon gets a chance to show love for the brethren. And that's how we are going to be known, if, you know, how, how, how people are going to know if we are his disciples, Christ's disciples, if we love one another. John 12, 34 through 35, it's, he writes, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And Peter writes in 1 Peter 4, 8, he says, Above all, keep fervent love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Okay? Love covers a multitude of sins. 
As fellow recipients of the gospel and as ambassadors of Christ to a lost world, we would do well to remember and treat other Christians as objects of God's affection who are equally deserving of being treated as such. Okay? You may not think they're anything, but Christ does. Okay? You may not think this person is worth two seconds of your time, but Christ does. Okay? Again, not based on who they are or what they've done, but all because of the person and work of Christ on their behalf. Okay. Now, we read the end of this letter, and what my mind immediately went to after finishing this little study was the question, did Philemon listen to Paul? Did Philemon listen to Paul? And scripture doesn't tell us either way. I want to bank on the fact that he did listen. Paul is so confident. Um, maybe not, I don't know. But history might be able to shed some, his, some, some light on this question. Okay. Uh, Pastor David Guzik, in his commentary on Philemon, writes, In A.D. 110, the bishop, or pastor of Ephesus, was named Onesimus. Okay. And it could have been the same man. If Onesimus was in his late teens or early 20s when Paul wrote this letter, he would be about 70 years old in A.D. 110. And that was not an unreasonable age for a bishop in those days. Pretty cool. He quotes this guy, and this quote says, Ignatius, in his epistle to the Ephesians, makes mention of Onesimus as pastor of Ephesus next after Timothy. The Roman martyrlogue says that he was stoned to death at Rome under Trajan the emperor. Okay. And then Guzik writes at the very end, There is also some historical evidence that the letters of Paul were first gathered as a group in the city of Ephesus. Perhaps Onesimus first compiled the letters and wanted to make sure that his letter, that his charter of freedom, was included. We can't verify this because Scripture doesn't say anything, but how many dudes do you know named Onesimus? I don't know. I like to think that, it, that Philemon did listen, that God did produce fruit, and that fruit did remain. Okay? Pretty cool. Now, in closing, we need to remember a few things. Sometimes we're the Onesimus in the story, and we need to remember that there was always time to turn to the Lord, and that when we do, he welcomes us back with open arms. Two, sometimes we are the Philemon in the story. And we, did, and we need to remember that God knows what is best, and we need to trust him with the unknowns of life. We also need to remember that when Christ saves a person, they are a new creation. Okay? The old is gone. Behold, all things are new. And we shouldn't treat people based on their past, but on their present. Third and finally, we need to remember that although people are new creations in Christ, nobody is perfect. Okay. Nobody's perfect, so we must allow room for failure, but be quick to extend grace. Let's remember to celebrate God's grace continually so that we may minister grace effectively. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for preserving these 25 verses all the way through the centuries for our benefit. I ask Lord, um, for all of us who might be an Onesimus right now or at some point, a Philemon right now or at some point, that these truths would resonate in our hearts and that we would be quick to extend grace, Lord. We thank you that if someone is in Christ, they are, they are in fact a new creation as, as, your, as your word states. And I pray that we would look at them in the present tense not holding anything over their heads based on what they did in the past, but move forward again with grace, Lord. We thank you for Paul's heart in this matter, and we ask that we would have a similar heart when it comes to dealing with people. It doesn't come naturally, so we need your Holy Spirit, so Holy Spirit's work you know, to do this, God. Give us opportunities. It's kind of a scary prayer to, to pray. But give us opportunities to live these things out this coming week, Lord. And may your Holy Spirit bring to remembrance um, these lessons. 
not just so we can pat ourselves on the back, but that we can glorify our Father in heaven and that people can see our good works and do the same. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. In your name I pray. Amen.